four million years later. Hi there, thanks for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where two old friends get together and watch an episode of Generation 1 Transformers cartoon series in story order and then get together to reflect on what they saw. We look at it from the perspective of people who encountered the show as young children back in the mid-80s and continue to love the franchise well into our young adulthood and now into our not-so-young adulthood. We reflect on it from all those different perspectives at the same time. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... The Hoove. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Every week, Hoover's title changes in reflection of what the title of the episode is. So here we are at episode 27 of the podcast, and what episode of the cartoon are we talking about? The Core by Dennis Marks. If memory serves, at the end of the last episode, I kind of made some groans and some uncomfortable noises when you said this was the one we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And having watched it again, 10,000 foot view... It's not bad. There's actually there's a lot to like in this episode, which is super surprising. Mm -hmm. It is another ACOM episode, so it has the yeah. bad animation, but I feel like they learned a little bit since the last two. It's slightly yeah. better. There's still a lot of problems, but this is definitely an episode that if you just listen to it, you think, well, that was pretty typical. Nothing, nothing overly bad about that. I remember the first time I listened to it in MP3 form rather than watched it, and I was surprised that it wasn't bad at all. So give that a try if you like. Yeah, and you'll, you'll hear some weird audio stuff, which we'll point out as we break down the episode. But for the most part, this is like, I feel like a very strong episode of the series based on like what we've sort of assembled as our criteria for the platonic ideal of a Transformers episode. Mm-hmm. A lot of great Megatron and Starscream moments in this one. Got some great human stuff happening in this one that makes me happy. <laughs> uh, a little light on Autobot interactions. In the, uh, I feel like we, we get we get some characterization, but like not a lot of not a deep dive. Because actually, I would say that the character that is explored largely in this episode is Devastator. Mm -hmm. So Constructicon fans should be very happy when upon encountering this one. So, all right, the core. By Dennis Marks. Who is Dennis Marks, Hoover? Well, this is his first ever Transformers episode. He will go on to do one more after this. And he was all over 70s and 80s cartoons, though. So you've probably seen his name and just not paid attention. He did Spider-Man and Amazing Friends. He did the Incredible mm. Hulk cartoon that came out at the same time. He did episodes of Turbo Teen. Oh! Galtar and the <laughs> Golden Lance. Dragon's oh, Lair. Foofer. Yay! And interestingly, 39 episodes of the Beatles cartoon. Oh, wow. The old black and white one? It was color. Oh, was it color? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I, maybe I watched it on a black and white TV when I was a kid. I remember seeing <laughs> it in syndication on the UHF station that I watched. Wow. Yeah, it was from around 1967 or so. Wow, okay. And he died on January 10th, 2006 at age 73. Okay. So he was, well, he was in his 40s and 50s then when he was working on Transformers somewhere in the neighborhood. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, let's get to the IMDb log line for the episode. The Decepticons endanger the Earth, well, don't they always, <laughs> by drilling into its core to tap into the planet's geothermal energy. Wait a second, they did that in Fire in the Sky. <laughs> All right, in order to stop them, the Autobots must hijack and reprogram Devastator. Ah, are we at... One of our first stories where reprogramming Autobots and Decepticons comes into play. I don't recall coming up against this plot point before. Yeah, I think this is the first instance. It's a natural idea for a story involving sentient robots, but I've got some prickly thoughts on how it's explored, but then I've got some very warm thoughts on how it's ultimately mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfolds. So take us through it, Hoover. Where do we begin in this one? Well, we open on a rushing river cutting through a mountainous area, and we follow that river to a waterfall, which splashes down into a cave, where we see a giant robotic drill drilling into the earth. And next to the drill is Constructicon Scrapper, who shouts out that the rock has fractured and they need to stop the drill before everything explodes. 
We pan over to the other Constructicon hook in vehicle mode who uses his crane arm hook to hit a certain button on an adjacent console. Now, before we move on, before we move on for a second, I want to make a note of Michael Bell's performance of Scrapper in this one. Did you notice it? Well, the problem is the Constructicons have appeared so infrequently, I don't yeah. tend to notice when they're, you know, quote-unquote out of character or unusual. So it feels like at this point they're still trying to figure out the performances of the Constructicon characters. I, Long Haul feels figured out to me, and we'll hear from him in a second. Mm -hmm. But Scrapper's performance, like when we hear him in Heavy Metal War, I would say take Major Blood and pitch him down two octaves. Right? Mm -hmm. Like he's got that, that Michael Bell evil voice where it's like gravelly, but it's kind of in the low range, but it still has like that, that Michael Bell treble. Mm -hmm. And then in City of Steel, his performances, it sounds more like kind of mean side swipe. Right? And there's mm -hmm. even that line where he even like, talks just like Sideswipe. He uses the Sideswipe voice. It sounds very pleasant. Look, Megatron, the Autobots are going to go to their own grave. And he chuckles. You know, mm -hmm. In this one, he's going full on Major Blood, and he's gasping between lines. You know, It's like, the drill! <gasps> she's drilling! <gasps> he does that <laughs> every line of this episode. And it's like he's like asthmatic Major Blood, and, is, and he's pitching it way high. <laughs> All the performances are interesting. You know, I love Michael Bell's work. But it's just, it, it's like evidence that like they were still sort of feeling out what these characters were. Hook feels like baked. Long Haul feels baked. Mm -hmm. uh, Mixmaster even has gives us a different performance in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's the way he was written too. But I, I just wanted to make sure that we put a circle around that because this is going to come up a couple times in the episode. So, but yes, Hook pushes a button next to an adjacent console. And what happens? Well, steam bellows out of the drill as it stops. Hook transforms and says he warned Scavenger that the site was unstable, and Scavenger then sets off an alarm and calls all the Constructicons to seal the crack in the earth made by the drill. So we're just jumping right in here. There's no Victor Caroli set in scene. Nothing like that. Yeah. And then Mixmaster and Longhaul arrive on the scene to assist. I'll glue it shut with quickset silicone. Longhaul, load those chemicals into my mixing drum. Load and unload. That's the story of my life, Mixmaster. Lucky for us, you're on the job. And lucky you're still the type of genius of a chemist. <laughs> Watch. And the pair begin sealing the crack in the earth with the others, using their lasers to seal it shut. And now we warned you guys, this is the last of the three Season 2 ACOM episodes. Things definitely aren't as polished looking as usual. However, they do look slightly better than the previous two done by ACOM. So, let's see how things go. And then suddenly we hear a familiar voice as Megatron complains that Scavenger should have detected the potential fissure in that rock before drilling began. And then he adds... Mixmaster, take Scavenger to the surface and check out his geologic analyzer circuits. What? How exactly <laughs> does one check out another's geologic analyzer circuits? And why do they have to go outside to do it? Is it like, right. oh, there's not enough light down here? And as we'll see, apparently it involves you both being in vehicle mode and looking at each other. <laughs> 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 but this feels like it's a, a plot centric like sort of movement to like well i gotta get these guys outside right as we'll yeah. see later on but but it's, there could have been another little bit of dialogue in there to explain that like well down here there's too much instrumentation there's gonna be electrical interference go outside where there's not as much stuff and then you could check a circuit or something mm -hmm. like that yeah but but no time for that as we pan over to Starscream sitting at a nearby computer terminal saying they were lucky this time, but Megatron's plan to get energy out of the Earth's core could destroy all of them. And let's also note that Megatron walks up to him as he's talking and he puts his hand on Starscream's quote unquote shoulder, like those mm -hmm. weird like vent things that stick on the side of his head. And he just rests his hand there. Like you, you think after everything that these two have been through together, like, OK, if he's going First, if he's going to put his hand on Starscream, it's going to be for violence. It's going to be a Homer Simpson, why you little kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But instead, he just like stands there with his hand on his shoulder. Yeah. But if I succeed, Starscream, and I will, we Decepticons will possess an energy source richer than any in the galaxy. The molten might of this planet itself. So pretty typical Megatron plan, but Starscream has more notes saying it's too dangerous because if you drill into a sphere like the Earth, <laughs> it will shatter with them on it. And to illustrate his point, he grabs a boulder, 
retracts his hand and unleashes a drill from it, drilling into the boulder as it shatters in his hand. But Megatron insists that he's being underestimated. Stepping over to a weird elevator-type device, the pair rise up to the Earth's surface as Megatron leads the way, saying, Follow me. The two walk over to a rock wall as Starscream sarcastically says, Sure, right through that solid rock, I suppose. And then Megatron walks right through that solid rock. Not Kool-Aid Man style, but the rock face is only a hologram. Oh. So Starscream is surprised, but follows him in as Megatron reveals what the hologram is hiding. A new space bridge to Cybertron. An emergency exit of sorts. Then if the drill does shatter the Earth, so be it. We will be safe, each and every last one of us. (laughs) Sweet. We get the return of the space bridge. We haven't seen a space bridge in a while. Yeah, it's been a bit. Have we seen any in season two? I don't think so. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to see it, like, rendered by the ACOM animators. It looks a little bit more softer on the edges looking, and, but it, the design is identical. It's got, like, that weird sort of beveled donut design with, mm-hmm. like, a computer terminal on the outside of it and a path leading up to the the entrance to the, like, a, like sort of like a horseshoe opening in the donut shape. I don't know. They don't use it this episode, but at least it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I was just glad to see like like Transformers lore persisting across the the season. So, so Megatron is fine with the Earth going boom as long as he gets the energy from it and bugs out back to Cybertron. <laughs> but what are the Autobots up to? We cut the gears, Mirage, Prowl, Jazz, and Sunstreaker driving through the desert. When suddenly they duke boys over a cliff. Sigh. (laughs) Yep. Like I've said before, it's like a requirement of an episode now that they do this ever since they did it the first time. Like somebody saw that and was like, hey, I really like that. You know, these are cars. We need to show off the fact that they're cars. You know what kids like to do with their toy cars? Yeah, and, and I mean, and it's true. Like, when I was playing with my brothers with Transformers and car toys, I mean, that is what we do. You make them jump over things. I mean, it's no it's no surprise that, like, Knight Rider and Dukes of Hazard both featured that as, like, a major thing that the cars do a lot, you know? I don't know why that's so exciting to me, you know? <laughs> but it, 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 when I was a kid, it was, it, was a, it was a very thrilling thing to make a car go in the air. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's like that fantasy of flying cars, you know, like that that we never ever got that we we're supposed to have by now. But <laughs> I will agree, this episode has much, has better animation than the other Acom episodes, but it still does a lot of this stuff where it's like let's look at them all on the horizontal as they just progress sideways across the screen, and we'll <laughs> really only animate just the wheels a little bit, you know, and and all the cars are clearly on the same piece of of acetate because when they go over bumps, they all move the same way at the same time instead of like you know like creating like a little bit of differentiation between their movements to make it feel like it's like a real environment so it's very 2d looking at times but yeah anyway well jazz splashes some mud onto gears as they drive so of course gears has to complain about that <laughs> and then suddenly they arrive at a dry riverbed which is perplexing because sunstreaker insists that there should be a river here He's sure he's right, so they backtrack a little bit and drive up a hill to learn the river's been diverted. And as they have a look, they see Mixmaster and Scavenger by the waterfall. Okay, Scavenger, your geologic analyzer circuits are better now than the day you were assembled. Let's transform and return to base. So that wasn't just a throwaway line. They actually followed up on it. And I still don't know what it means or why it had to be done on the surface rather than underground, but okay. And notice that Mixmaster's performance is now not like the the word-repeating lunatic. Or like, so like in City of Steel, he was more like, right, 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 Mega Mega Megatron, which is like, okay. But we we talked about that. It's like, okay, we remembered it as children, so it must have worked. But then, like, you go to Heavy Metal War, where he's more like like the the stumbling kind of thinker. Actually, he kind of talks like how I talk on this show a lot. Mm -hmm. And then now, he just sounds like very arrogant scientist, right? Like, like he's, he's very 
very pleased with himself in a way that Hook is, the Hook feels more restrained in his egotism, whereas Mixmaster feels more like a flamboyant egotist in this one. Mm. So I want to keep an eye on for how these performances change throughout the season. If we get any work, yeah, we do have a little bit more Constructicons later on, but anyway. But yeah, so and and also like they're like when we see them, they're just like sitting next to the river in vehicle mode, just with their their front parts of their vehicles facing each other. So apparently, checking <laughs> his geologic stabilizers or whatever is like I just look at you really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's got like it's doing something with sensors, running a diagnostic. Who knows? They're future creatures. <laughs> so then the constructor cons head back below, and the Autobots decide to give chase. But by the time they get to the waterfall, they've lost the Constructicons. But Laserbeak, flying above, has spotted them. He returns to the caves below and flies into Soundwave's awaiting tape deck. And then Soundwave plays back what Laserbeak recorded, and Megatron instantly recognizes the voices of the Autobots. Laserbeak plays back the part where the Autobots spotted the Constructicons and instantly is incensed that they were spotted. He orders the Constructicons accompany him to the surface for some Autobot extermination before they can radio back their location. Megatron didn't go to all the trouble of covering things up with a hologram just to be discovered by crummy Autobots. And here, when, when Megatron is listening to the message, they do two little cutaway scenes. Like they, so they show Soundwave's chest with the tape rolling, and then we cut to Megatron, and he's walking towards Soundwave as we're listening to the message. And so the first one is a horizontal shot of him walking, and like it's a full like walk cycle where his shoulders are moving, his arms are moving in opposition to one another. And then we look at the tape deck again, and then we cut to Megatron. Now he's walking right towards the camera, the, the cave receding behind him as he's you know lurching forward. And it's like, the thing that's so interesting about the ACOM episodes is there's so much movement. Everything's moving, but it's just moving in like this kind of low frame rate, kind of clunky, kind of slightly off model way all the time, which adds up to, you know, that th I think this is why this episode like left such a bad taste in my mouth when I was younger. Like it was, it was easily one of my least favorite episodes be mm -hmm. because of that stuff like that. And, and it doesn't have... The last couple episodes we've been spending a lot of time talking about like the framing and the staging and the blocking and it, it doesn't do it as dynamically as those other episodes does like when you look at that shot of megatron walking towards the camera it's like it's it's fine it's it's functional it, it tells what it needs to tell but does it feel like megatron is like scary menacing intense not i wouldn't say that i wouldn't use those i would just say he's, he's walking towards you it feels objective i guess is what i'm trying to say <laughs> instead of subjective yeah so then Megatron orders the Constructicons to merge into Devastator and to attack without mercy. I, I gotta interject here too. When he says merge and form, the, the, the Constructicons finish his sentence for him and they, they all go, Devastator! And they pump their arms in the air like, like high school sports kids <laughs> and then they turn into Devastator. That felt a little bit awkward too. <laughs> well, the five Autobots are in the very act of radioing home when Devastator comes up behind them and knocks them off the cliff with a giant boulder of course there's boulders sitting around everywhere it's a transformers cartoon Sorry. they topple down all of them but mirage who's left to face devastator on his own and then devastator uses some eye blasts to take out mirage as he too topples off the cliff he manages to grab a tree growing out of the cliffside to catch his fall it's a very strong tree and then he mm -hmm. turns invisible this moment really grabbed me as a child. I remember this felt intense because Mirage says the line, I may shatter when I hit the ground, but at least they'll never find my pieces. <laughs> and that, in, in the, I, I don't want to say the delivery is especially dramatic because, again, like the staging and the blocking in ACOM episodes are like very objective. Feels like the camera's just on a tripod. And the performance that Frank Walker gives feels kind of glib. Like, I, I don't want to say that. He, Frank Walker was being glib, but Mirage's line feels like it's delivered in that kind of like semi-cheerful one-liner kind of voice. But it's the it's the content of what he says that made me as a kid go like, oh my gosh, is Mirage gonna die? You know? Mm. It's just abstract enough that I feel like it's not especially gory or celebr celebratory uh, in terms of violence, but it does, it, I, I want to congratulate the writer for writing a line that made my little 11-year-old brain like light up. Because I was, I was very concerned for him in that scene. Well, Devastator, meanwhile, hops down to confront the other Autobots, but it's a lopsided fight as Devastator uses his eye beams on them. Squash Autobots like the Canoans! <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> 
you know, at, at the Cybertron Zoo, the Helio hamsters, sometimes they get a little hungry. What do you feed them? Mechano ants. Mm. <laughs> I had no idea when we started this that we would be able to compile such a huge list of Cybertronic Zoo animals. And if I'd known that, I would have, like, make more efforts to write them all down. You know, it's occurring to me that there's an opportunity here for Like, I, I don't have, like, a really strong desire to ever do, like, a fan art book of anything. But <laughs> this might be the thing, right? It's like like doing, like, a, the, the text, what would it be, like, taxonomy or the, uh, the compendium of Cybertronic mm. wildlife. <laughs> And, like, do the thing that everybody does with these kind of things where you have to, like, retroactively tie it into a di line of dialogue from the episode to, like, explain why Sideswipe said it that way. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Titanium moose bots are especially pernicious on the Cybertronian freeways. And the faster <laughs> vehicles are always bumping into them, ramming into them, crashing into them. You know? It's like scientists, they don't care about Titanium moose bots. But <laughs> those, those, those race cars, man, they hate them. <laughs> So we cut scenes and the Constructicons are back down below overseeing the giant drill. Starscream looks on from afar and reminds everyone to keep on schedule. <laughs> but then we see some footprints made by invisible feet. I wonder who made these. And then we hear Mirage say that he has to radio the plans to some fellow Autobots. And then we cut back to the Autobots from before still fighting Devastator. But we just saw three of the aforementioned Constructicons back below down under the Earth. So, <laughs> thanks, Acom. Hey, at least, at least Shockwave wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. I just showed up to see what's going on. That's a big drill. <laughs> just let you know I'm still uh, watching Cybertron. You know, took a break. Took a break. Saw there was a space bridge in operation out here. Thought I'd say hi. Anybody miss me? Nobody misses me. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Shockwave. <laughs> the Devastator is laughing off the Autobots' puny lasers as Mirage returns to the group. He retracts his right hand and unleashes a grappling hook, much like we've seen Jazz use before. And mm -hmm. he fires it towards Sunstreaker, who catches it and orders Jazz to hit Devastator with a light show to momentarily blindside him. So Jazz unleashes some strobe lighting from his waist, and the Titan averts his eyes and steps back. And then, clearly having seen The Empire Strikes Back, Sunstreak and Mirage, each with one end of the cable from the grappling hook, drive in opposite circles around Devastator, pulling his feet together, tripping him up. Not wanting to push their luck, the Autobots all transform to cars and speed out of there. And it's worth watching Devastator's very graceful fall <laughs> when they trip him up. Acom, thanks again. <laughs> we change scenes and the group is back at the Ark as Prime says that Teletran has predicted that Megatron's drilling operation will shatter the Earth. Okay, let's underline this. Optimus and Starscream always say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> they both come to the same conclusion about the fault in Megatron's plans. Wow. And a very gray-colored Prowl remarks that he's afraid the Devastator tips the odds too far in Megatron's favor. Again, Prowl's line is about military strategy, so I like that. That's excellent. Pure Sunbow. Mm -hmm. And then who rolls in but Chip Chase? Yay! Turns out he and Wheeljack have been brainstorming and have come up with something. A Dominator disc to override Devastator's circuits. And bring him under our control. Devastator, under Autobot control? Sure. We secretly place one of these on each of the Constructicons. When they all join together, zap! Our Dominator discs will make Devastator ours. Probably. We hope. So now they're essentially ripping off Megatron's plan from Day of the Machines. Prime thinks it's a swill idea and assembles what he calls a commando raiding party. Who we soon see is made up of Prime, Ironhide, Mirage, Wheeljack, Jazz, and Sunstreaker. They return to the secret Decepticon staging area and enact their plan. Step one involves freezing the waterfall that's running down to the drill. Ironhide blasts the waterfall with coolant from his retracted hand cannons. Yeah, and then they do this weird thing where their hands go into their wrists and like instead of like pulling out a new weapon, rockets come out and they slowly descend the side of the, the mountain from their wrist rockets. 
it looks really goofy. Can we back up two steps, though? Because you said something I think is really worth identifying and clarifying, expanding upon maybe a little bit, is you said they're ripping off Megatron's plan from Day of the Machines. Let's remind everybody what the plan was from Day of the Machines, even though it was only a couple episodes ago, right? You put these these disks or chips on machines, and then Torque 3, the you know warped computer, can control them and make them do evil things, right? Mm-hmm. That was Megatron's plan. Yep. Wheeljack and Chip are working on Megatron's plan. And they're specifically called, and I don't know how intentional this was in the writer's part, but they're called Dominator Disks. In other words, our plan is to enslave Devastator. (laughs) And as I watch this as an adult, I'm like, I got issues with this. Mm -hmm. I have real big issues with this whole idea of Chip Chase, of all people, suggesting that now now, take another two steps back. Like Chip worked with the munitions plant and roll for it. Like he's he's created weapons before. So it's like his hands aren't totally clean. But I'm like, really? You want to enslave another living thing? Now, well, remember, now, Jersey, yeah. Prime's yes. text specs says enslaving Decepticons is the right of all noble Autobots. All, all. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I like that you put noble, too. <laughs> um, but I, I, so I, this one sent me down a little bit of a path because I, I, as I was wrestling with that, I'm like, well, why? How can this be okay? And so then I, whenever I'm stuck on something like that, I always go to, okay, well, what is a kid's worldview? What, how is a kid engaging with this? And I, and I went back to how I felt about this episode as a child. And I got to tell you that as a kid who was, neither of us, we've said this a bunch of times, neither of us are what you would call athletic, mm-hmm. nor were we as children. We were not sporty kids, you know. And we also weren't like the kind of kids who threw around our strength in ways to make other kids feel small, you know? So I was, I was, I wasn't a shy kid, but I was a sensitive kid and I was a pretty gentle kid too. And I had fantasies about having a bigger friend who could like help me out (laughs) when I'm, when I'm in a jam, you know, I had a number of friends growing up who like kind of were that friend for me. Like they were bigger, they were a little braver. And so I thought, well, maybe that's what this is really like looking at it from the kid's perspective. This is about, like soliciting the help of the big scary person to, you know, be your defender against the other big scary guys, right? And I just want to put a pin in this idea of the problematic nature of these things being called dominator discs, so these mm-hmm. things that dominate, that enslave, that capture, that that bend the will of another sentient living thing to make them do things that you want them to do. That's not what good guys do. Mm-hmm. And I'll leave that thought there. And then we will round back to it as we proceed through the episode. So, but back to Autobots making weird rocket wrists and slowly descending down the mountain. <laughs> and then I'll also give ACOM actually points for this next moment is when they land at the bottom of the riverbed that's now frozen by Ironhide. The shot spins. I don't know if you've noticed this. The shot spins upside down. And like, you're, why would you look at the river upside down? And then it fades and it switches to the drill under, underground in the exact same composition as the frozen waterfall in the riverbed. So that at least was pretty nice. And now down below, the drill with no more water to cool it as it works begins to heat up immensely, and Scrapper orders that they stop the drill at once and get to the surface. They arrive to investigate the lack of water flow, but the sneaky Autobots manage to stealthily tag each Constructicon with a Dominator disc. And here we learn that the Constructicons must be nearly blind because they don't (laughs) spot any of the easily visible Autobots around them. They are so brightly colored in ACOM episodes too. So it's like, you're you're not missing Sunstreaker. You are just (laughs) not. He's like, he's he's virtually neon. But once all the Constructicons are tagged, Prime lowers a weird cage thing to the valley below to pick up all the Autobots and get them out of there. And it looks like the Autobots just staged a successful commando raid. Except... We're suddenly looking down the barrel of a gun through a viewfinder at the escaping Autobots. It's like shooting dynamite ducks in a beryllium barrel! And I mean dead ducks! Yes, folks, it's Starscream about to put a kibosh on the Autobots' great plan as we head to commercial. Oh, what exciting products are we going to be tempted with today? Well, since Starscream is taking aim with a gun, this commercial for Zap It will tell us how we can shoot Dad and or the mailman. That's fun. (laughs) 
Watch out, America. You never know where Zap it'll pop up next. Zap? Yeah. Bobby! Zap it! Zap <laughs> it! Or maybe since the Autobots are being so stealthy, they can get the help of these other robots in disguise. Matchbox Parasites! From Haley's Comet Kong, the Parasites. They hide in cars and trucks. We'll hide here. Nemesite the Hunter. You can't hide from him. I feel like we're being watched. Yeah. Or maybe, since these guys are all metal, maybe we can just enjoy this commercial for people who are only partly metal and partly real. Silverhawks, partly metal, partly real, mighty warriors with the powers to protect space from all evil. Muscles busting out, shredding it too. Stargazer seen us. Figures with weapon birds sold separately. Slybird, surgery board, quicksilver, activate power wings, Gallywalk, engage to the wing. Now take him down. Silverhawks! <laughs> Did it freak you out at all if they were called partly metal, partly real? Because that freaked me out as a kid. I was like, well, wait a minute. Well, wait, what's, what's the metal part that is not real? <laughs> Metal's real, right? Or is it like other like interdimensional metal? <laughs> yeah, it's very awkwardly stated. Like real obviously means flesh, but yeah. the way they put it, 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 it's weird. It, in the extended intro, which plays at the very first episode, which has like, uh, oh, I, I could spend another hour talking about Silverhawks and I won't, but <laughs> th- th- it has this soaring kid logic kind of poetry to the, uh, to the exposition where they say, born of a time beyond time, they sacrifice their human bodies modified to withstand the stress of the long journey through deep space or something like that. Born of a time beyond time. What? What does that mean? <laughs> they sacrifice their human bodies? What? <laughs> <laughs> Man, it was just like everything about that was meant to just like hit a kid right in the right in the glands. Okay, so but I don't want to get too excited about that. Let's get back to talking about Transformers. So we're back from break, right? Well, let's also not uh, just glaze over dynamital ducks in a beryllium <laughs> barrel. So I guess <laughs> dynamital ducks animals. are also at the Cybertron Zoo. <laughs> Uh, where, where do you keep your good energon? You know, the really rich stuff. Oh, we keep that in a beryllium barrel out mm. back. We let it age for 70 trillion astroseconds. <laughs> then, then it tastes just right. Yeah, yeah. The, I, the book is writing itself with yeah. all these references. <laughs> it's almost like they're training an AI to write episodes. <laughs> maybe maybe one of these episodes coming up is like a pen name for an AI machine, and we just never know. <laughs> Uh, when the singularity comes, it'll it'll course through all time, forward and backward. So yeah, yeah, it could be that this has like been written years from now, but <laughs> released back then. So, but speaking of the now, we're back from break. So what happens when we get back to Starscream? Murder them? <laughs> well, as we return, we're looking down Starscream's viewfinder and this rifle that he has as he's about to blast. But we see Megatron behind him lower Starscream's rifle and say, let them go. This perplexes Starscream, but Megatron explains. Why destroy a paltry six Autobots when we can eliminate them all forever? They think they're going to gain control of a Devastator, but I have other plans. Wow, so yet another example of Megatron one-upping the Autobots at all times. Megatron knew all about this stealthy commando raid and even deduces exactly what they were up to. That's very classic Megatron, and I can't say I don't like it, though it still would have been advantageous (laughs) to take out the six Autobots, I think. Yeah, there's something that feels kind of malicious about what he's up to with this particular scene. He's like, well... We could just pick them off with a sniper rifle, but I really want to watch them all get smushed under Devastator's foot <laughs> later on. You know, it's like I want to be up close and I want to look Mirage in the eye and go, oh, you feel you feeling at home? You feeling at home, buddy? Is he getting squished? Yeah, when this when I watched this scene, I remember the exact thought I had was like, oh, Hoover's got to love this. This is very similar to the rocket base hologram scenario yeah. where Megatron <laughs> was like, oh, did you really think you could pull one over on me? <laughs> this is the setup of that. If you were to con- con- compare it to a joke construction, the setup has to be the Megatron knows. The payoff is when Megatron rubs it in Prime's face that he knew. Mm-hmm. You know? So I feel like that's what that scene's about. He's letting them go because he really wants to look him in the eye and he wants them to know that he knew. (laughs) 
Well, then we see Megatron and Starscream, now joined by Soundwave, Thundercracker, Skywarp, and the Constructicons, setting up a little raid of their own. They position themselves along the path that the Autobots are using to roll for home, and they unleash their firepower on them, getting into a full-fledged battle. Now, I'm not sure how this was preferable to taking them all out with a sniper <laughs> rifle, but maybe secretly Megatron just didn't want Starscream to succeed in picking off the Autobots as they left, as I'm sure he knows he'd never hear the end of it if Starscream was successful. Yeah. Yeah, actually, this would be, he would be very much like Transformers Prime Starscream, which for three seasons, mm. he finds a way to mention that he killed Cliffjumper. <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> he says it a lot. So yes, I imagine that if he could wipe out six Autobots, Megatron was just saving himself, like, keeping some <laughs> peace and quiet. He's like, yeah, I hate Mirage. I hate it a lot. But, but man, I also love a good night's sleep. <laughs> I Starscream assassinated six Autobots in one fell swoop on my my lonesome. Yes. We All know. right, we know. <laughs> and then it cuts to Ravage putting his paws over his ears. <laughs> Frenzy, did I ever tell you about the time I assassinated six Autobots in one fell swoop all by my lonesome? <laughs> Frenzy Three minutes ago, Archie. Starscream. <laughs> Yeah, it's Frenzy slowly doing the Archie Bunker thing where he like pantomimes loading a gun and then putting it to his head <laughs> while Starscream's talking. <laughs> so then the Seekers get into a fracas with Prowl, who fires some missiles their way, as the Constructicons merge into Devastator to take on the other Autobots. And then suddenly we see more Autobots are here somehow as we see Huffer out of nowhere. As he, Jazz, and either Blue Streak or Prowl literally get kicked to the side by Devastator. As the onslaught continues, Devastator picks up Prime as Wheeljack speeds towards the combiner with Chip Chase inside, holding the computer controls for their Dominator discs. Chip flips the switch and Devastator begins to glow. Prime says to Devastator, Put me down, Devastator, and attack the Decepticons! Yes, Optimus Prime, I obey. And sure enough, he does. He swats the Seekers from the air and fires upon a retreating Megatron. Chip celebrates the fact that their plan worked as Devastator uses his eye beams to collapse the cave entrance that the Decepticons just fled into. Well, Ironhide wants to finish them off, but Prime says they're trapped in there with no water for their drills, so basically their plans are through. Better to get back home for repairs. And the Autobots celebrate Devastator being a nice guy and head for home with their new ace in the hole. Yeah, so it, it shows the scene of the Autobots standing again on the ridge near the top of the waterfall that we've been coming back and forth from the whole episode. And Devastator flies through, like up from the ground in front. Mm. Like, so we're, well, we're looking at the Autobots from behind as they're looking over the cliff, and then Devastator flies up into the, into the line of sight, and they all cheer as he flies away. Like, so yay, it really feels like... Yay, yay, he's ours now, yay! Yeah, he feels like the Superman kind of moment. Now, mm -hmm. I, I, again, the grown-up me is watching this going like, yeah, you're cheering the fact that you just brainwashed a guy. That's not <laughs> really cool, and I'm surprised at all of you. But the kid in me was like, boy, wouldn't it be cool if I could make those big, tough guys who give me a hard time because I, you know, I dress like a nerd and I love nerdy things. Because, like, I, I think bullying is still a thing, unfortunately. And it was it was when we were kids, too, you know, and like at least in the area I grew up in, uh, it was largely like the grownups looked the other way. It's like, hey, solve your problem, son. You know, I'm like, yeah, but he's huge. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, I, I don't, I don't quite, you know, you, you teach me math, right? And like bigger numbers, there's bigger than smaller numbers, bigger dude, it's bigger than the smaller dude, you know? Anyway, so like that moment, like, I remember feeling that joy, like, oh, Devastator, now the good guys have like a really powerful friend, you know, like the, the whole brainwashing thing completely flew over my head as a child, or mm -hmm. if it didn't. I was I was willing to make that moral sacrifice <laughs> right. for the security of having a big guy to help me. <laughs> right. But as an adult, I watch I'm like, oh, they better not win with this strategy. Like this this can't go on for very long, you know. So yeah, so the Autobots are heading home with their new brainwashed friend. What mm -hmm. are the Decepticons up to? Well, inside their collapsed cave base, Starscream doesn't get Megatron's strategy. 
Your strategy eludes me, Megatron. We're prisoners and we've lost our most valuable asset. We've lost nothing. I allowed the Autobots to believe Devastator was in their power. But with this electronic disruptor, I can nullify their control and bring Devastator back under my command. And at the moment they least expect it, Devastator will turn on them and destroy them all. Why didn't you tell me? I wanted you to believe the battle was real. You're such a rotten actor, you couldn't fool a Saturnian simpleton. Okay. Is it Saturnian simpleton? Yeah, that's how I read it. It sounded to me. They sure love their alliteration and these little phrases they come up with. <laughs> but finally, it all makes sense. Megatron always is in control. He is rarely ever surprised. He almost always knows stuff the Autobots don't think he knows. And that is the hallmark to me of a great villain. If he's always calling the shots, never taken unawares, that's really cool. That makes mm -hmm. it that much harder for the heroes to overcome that villain. So that makes mm -hmm. for a good story. So this episode may not look too pretty, but so far it's not too shabby. Yeah, Megatron is actually, he seems pretty, like, even when you listen to it, he seems pretty scary. He's a good villain in this one, so. And it turns out they didn't need the diverted river to cool the drill anymore, as Megatron stored enough water down there to finish the job. Again, Megatron always three steps ahead, that's great. But Starscream still thinks it's a dangerous plan, but, oh yeah, the space bridge. In case you forgot, kids. Remember that thing we said in the first act? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like the eight cop episodes do this a little bit. Like they, they kind of like really put uh, well, how's the expression go? Put a lampshade on mm -hmm. a plot point that will come into play later on in the episode. Don't forget about the space bridge. We mention it. We're going to mention it again. I'm surprised Optimus doesn't mention it, but he doesn't know about it, so he can't mention it. So, so okay. So is everybody happy? Are we going to get back to work? And with that, they turn the drill back on to drill down to the Earth's core and proceed as planned. Meanwhile, back at the Ark, we see Hook aiding Wheeljack with repairing Jazz. He did it. He welded the perimeter of your microcircuit. Of course I did it. I can perform flawlessly to within one five hundred thousandth of a Cybertronic mini-inch. And so, how do you like that, Jersey? One five thousandth <laughs> of a Cybertronic mini-inch. Why do the ACOM episodes have to throw out all the really cool measurements? <laughs> Mega miles and astro seconds and astro liters. Why can't we have ast astro centimeters? <laughs> uh, a Cybertronic mini inch? <laughs> Bless you for including the clip because you know that I love like the debating the Transformers measurement system and how <laughs> silly it is. But it's like, you could do better than Cybertronic mini inch. Come on. <laughs> uh, again, like astro second is... is profoundly silly and dumb and, and, and joyfully dumb, but Cybertruck and Mini-Inch just sounds like, okay, that was the first draft, and we needed to come at it again. <laughs> but yes, perform flawlessly within one five thousandth of a Cybertronic Mini-Inch. <laughs> that's small. That, that's smaller than Micron small. That's like you're splitting electrons when you get that small. But then suddenly, the Earth under the arc quakes, causing fissures to open up, of course, along the floor and the walls, and Chip to fall out of his wheelchair. Prime picks him up and instantly knows in his gut that Megatron has resumed his drilling. Hook rolls back to a headless Devastator that's just sitting on like a big console <laughs> makeshift chair thing. Yeah. And Hook transforms into Devastator's head, though that's not how that works. And I remember watching this as a kid going, No! Hook doesn't <laughs> transform into his head. <laughs> I love that that's something that's like that's a common experience for like all 10 and 11 year olds is like watching a grown up do it wrong <laughs> and saying no that way. <laughs> oh, I like your little Pikachu. No, that's a Raichu. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we all turn into Lauren Bacall when we're angry at an adult for saying it or doing it wrong. But yes, when Devastator's headless body is sitting in like sort of hunched over, you clearly see hooks shoulder parts on the shoulders of Devastator, right? Yeah. And then, like, he just picks it up, and, like, he sort of smushes Hook's vehicle form into a ball and then just, like, put it, puts it where his neck is and then moves his hands away, and there's a head there. Uh, yeah, it, that was designed to make 10-year-olds angry. 
<laughs> so Prime knows that they have to act fast so the drill doesn't make the Earth go boom. So they all head out, or at least some of them do. But remember, Megatron's always in the driver's seat, and he's watching the Autobots in the arc on his view screen. He's literally watching through Devastator's eyes. He grabs his electronic disruptor and awaits the Autobots' arrival. Frank Walker does a really nice laugh, like a like a low chuckle here as he's looking through that. And he, when he turns to Starscream, he's like, oh, isn't it wonderful looking, seeing our enemies through Devastator's eyes. Listen for that line, everybody. It's it's a really good delivery, and it makes him... He's, taking, he's, he's allowing himself to enjoy being one step ahead of everybody just a little bit. Not too much. But just enough, mm -hmm. like Starscream, Starscream would write three books about it, and he would like go on TV and he'd tell everybody in the world about like how <laughs> far ahead of everybody he was, you know. Megatron's like all he permits himself is one little sly remark, and that's another thing that makes him feel like a really good villain, mm -hmm. is that he doesn't feel like he has the weakness of arrogance, no. the way some of the other Decepticons do. Well, Devastator and the Autobots arrive, and Devastator blasts away the collapsed rubble from the cave entrance, allowing he and the Autobots to enter. Autobots transform to robot mode, and we see Prime is carrying Chip along with him. He sets him down as they get to the drill, and pulls out his rifle, planning to put a stop to the drill for good. Wheeljack yells for Devastator to smash it, but Megatron appears with his electronic disruptor, yelling for him to attack the Autobots instead. As he pulls the switch, Devastator sparks with electricity and falls to the ground. Rising up, he says, Yes, I am a Decepticon and attacks the Autobots with those eye lasers of his. Chip messes with his controls to no avail, and then rapidly has to wheel away when some rocks collapse down near him. Megatron and Starscream join Devastator's side and declare the Autobots finished as we head to our second commercial break. Ooh, well, that for you, Autobots, and that for you, Chip. Brainwashing doesn't get you very far, because... <laughs> This is a good line. I actually really, really like this line is that Devastator says, yes, I am a Decepticon. He's saying, this is who I really am. You guys took that away from me, you know? Mm. And I think this is an excellent act break too, because like for me as an adult watching, it has all of that in it. It has like the failure of the good guys and also the fact they deserve to fail because they mm. did it wrong. And for once... A bad guy is totally in the right on this. Yes, the Decepticons are bad. Yes, the Decepticons want to conquer and, they, and you know, you, tyranny and all that stuff. But forcibly brainwashing them is not the path to victory, you know? <laughs> As a matter of fact, you just put yourself on an equal footing with Megatron because you used his plan. <laughs> so as I wag my finger at Optimus Prime <laughs> for, for green lighting this, what kind of things should our parents spend money on for us who <laughs> Well, it seems like since the Autobots are so outnumbered, maybe they need to call for backup, maybe from m m, -m mask Mask, where illusion is the ultimate weapon. Convert Switchblade to jet mode. Surprise, Matt Tracker. It's Mayhem! Battle station, protect the decoder, Bruce. I'm going up. Stacks, ready to fire! Mask, Switchblade, Thunderhawk, and Rhino. Fire! Each sold separately with action figure. <laughs> Illusion is the ultimate weapon. <laughs> and T-Bob is the ultimate reinforcement. <laughs> you know, I do like T-Bob. I don't love T-Bob, but I don't love anybody in the mask cartoon, to tell you the truth. <laughs> we, we'll have to do like a digression episode someday just to like talk about some of like the parallel or tangential cartoons of that period and how mask is like somewhere it's like we show up going like, all right, let me watch it go. Oh, oh, I really <laughs> wanted to like this. Man, I wanted to like this. <laughs> And everybody, if whoever starts a Patreon, I think he would be able to get everybody to sign up for it just by promising his T-Bob impersonation. <laughs> you need to hear it. He won't do it. He's not going to do it. But I, I, I'm telling you, as somebody who's known him for a long time, it's magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing I will say about Mask is that, again, it's like it's one of these things where your memories of it are great. But yeah. I tried to rewatch it as an adult, and it just sounds to me like the whole thing had to be recorded in a room <laughs> where a baby was sleeping. <laughs> they did not have Wally Burr to get the performance out of these voice actors. Oh my god! <laughs> Their performance is like at a six at best. They're like, 
darn that mask they're making me retreat <laughs> and, and Matt Tracker's like oh no Scott T-Bob you're in danger if they had just had Wally Burr that cartoon yeah. would probably be through the roof it would be through the roof with awesomeness it was early Deke too so like the animation was not bad it was pretty good animation mm -hmm. yes yeah. but, but it, then it gets super problematic in the later seasons and they start just becoming race cars and stuff but we'll go into that <laughs> another time but maybe. yeah, it's <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so okay, well, but the toys were amazing, and I'm playing mm -hmm. with my Condor, and I'm playing with my uh, Switchblade right now. So, what other things can I tell my mom to go buy me? <laughs> <laughs> well, here comes another commercial, and it's working that Victor Caroli connection. And how about we call on some of the Thunder, 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 Thunder Cats? Thundercats, Cat Flare. Will Cat Flare's electronic laser beam destroy the mutant vehicle? Laser! Direct laser hit. Cat Flare's doors are blown open. <laughs> and Snarfer. Snarfer's pretty awesome. T-Bob, pretty good. Snarfer, super good. <laughs> <laughs> or if the Autobots are really hard up for assistance here, maybe they'll have to resort to calling in the Care Bear Cousins? In the forest of feelings, kids find the dozens. Love to play with the Care Bear Cousins. Cozy Heart Penguin greets you with a wave. And Brave Heart Lion is mighty and brave. Which are pretty great. Playful Heart <laughs> Monkey, Bright Heart Raccoon. Oh my gosh, there are all sorts of animals now. Lots of Heart Elephant, Proud Heart Cat. <laughs> Crazy Zap <set> Mice. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think there was a mouse cousin. Now that I think about it, interesting. All right. Well, I think my missed opportunity. <laughs> hey, I actually recorded an audio commentary, sort of like retrospective of the Care Bears movie with Raina Telgemeier. This is something that's known as name dropping, <laughs> and we both had nothing but soaring, loving things to say about that movie. <laughs> and that's not part of the Saturday Supercast. If you can still find it, if not, email me. I will try to track down the MP3 of it for you. So, okay, I'm covered in products now, so can we please get back to the, the cartoon? Well, as we return, we see Devastator backing the Autobots into a corner as Megatron eggs him on. But the drill begins to smoke, causing an earthquake, and Prime knows that this is bad news. Giant fissures, of course, open up as the Autobots <laughs> rush not to be engulfed by the erupting Earth. And then Megatron's all-important water reservoir spills out due to the quake, thus effectively ending any chance he has of success here. Sunstreaker manages to rescue Chip from the cave-in as carnage ensues around them. Wheeljack tries desperately to get Devastator back under their control, but it fries his logic circuits, causing him to attack everyone. Mm -hmm. So Devastator picks up Starscream and throws him into the drill controls, which starts it up again with no coolant, meaning it's going to blow. Yeah, so let's talk about that. When he throws Starscream into the controls, this is, Acom did a good job here. Like, you see Starscream's spine, like, wrap itself around that console. It looks like a painful hit. <laughs> but I'm always going to notice this stuff, Hoover. And I'm, when I notice it, I'm going to celebrate it and point at it and cheer. Wheeljack... It, when Devastator's attacking them, he starts button mashing his device, <laughs> the Dominator discs, right? So we have the nullifier versus the Dominator discs, and it's, and Wheeljack's like smashing the controls, and Chip says to Wheeljack, be careful. If you overload his circuits, it'll fry his logic chips or something like that. So once again, the human points to the Autobot and says, like, be careful. <laughs> you know, he doesn't say it in words in the episode, but like the idea that I got from this is like, Chip realizes that they, they made a mistake that that was the wrong tactic to try to take him over. Wheeljack, the Autobot, the advanced robot from another planet who doesn't make as good decisions as humans, is like, well, I'll just try to do the same thing, but way harder! <laughs> he hits the buttons hard, you know? And what does that do? It sends Devastator on a rampage because now he's, he's, he's not in his head anymore because these two people are trying to like push him back and forth and brainwash him in their own ways. And Chip realizes there's got to be another way to get Devastator on our side, as we'll get to, to shortly. But in the meantime, we got this immediate emergency, is that, yeah, Devastator's now indiscriminately picking up anybody and throwing them all over the place, right? <laughs> so Megatron calls a retreat, ordering all Decepticons to the space bridge. Devastator follows them out, but crashes up through the space bridge and starts wailing on the Decepticons. 
And this has totally destroyed their space bridge, so now they can't escape Earth. The only choice now is to stop the drill before it makes the Earth go boom. Mm-hmm. Wheeljack pops out of the hole that made by Devastator in the space bridge. He's like, funny, we just came to the same conclusion. <laughs> and so now it's Wheeljack standing next to Megatron, right? Yep, everyone realizes they're all on the same side now. They're on the side of survival. You and me, we're in this together now. None of them can stop us now. We will make it through somehow. Everyone's interest to stop this drill so the Earth doesn't blow up with all of them on it. Prime surrenders the Dominator Disk control box to Megatron, postulating that if they combine frequencies with Megatron's electronic disruptor, that they may be able to get Devastator back under control. Starscream objects and runs to Devastator, who merely blasts him into a giant boulder. <laughs> Yeah, it's really weird. It's like, okay, you know, Devastator just threw you into that control console and almost broke your spine, right? But, like, Megatron actually says, like, Starscream's like, we can't do this. And Megatron says, Starscream, we're all in this together now. Which is like, whoa, whoa, mm-hmm. Megatron, that's new, you know? And he even says it in kind of like a low voice, like like kind of in the same voice he used when he was saying, when Gears, when he was like, oh, this, 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 obviously <laughs> that circuit controlled your personality, mm-hmm. you know? You could tell Frank Walker's delivering it with, like, yeah, it disgusts me, but we're all in this mm-hmm. together now. Yeah. And Starscream is like, panics, runs towards Devastator, and he runs toward him and he says, Devastator, help! <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that wasn't very well thought through, and that for you, now he smashed into a boulder. <laughs> so Megatron surrenders his electronic disruptor to Wheeljack, and he says, I do this only for the benefit of my Decepticons. It grieves me that you may also profit. And that is a cool line. It's a great line. It's a great line. It's a great delivery. And it's something that as a child and as an adult, I love that moment. The folks who are listening to the podcast, you heard it. You heard how the delivery was. I advise you to, to listen to this episode. It's not a bad looking scene when he's saying this line, but it just it's so much better when you just focus on Frank Walker's delivery. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what I do now I do for them, you know? Like I'm I'm stooping right now. I'm going beneath my dignity to have to work with this idiot next to me, this guy who talks <laughs> like a traveling salesman. You know? And and what's more is when I do this, he's gonna get something out of it. That sucks. I'm really unhappy about this arrangement. But you know, Soundwave is a little family of tapes. I can't say no to them, you know? It's, it's Christmas for Decepticons, too. So, yeah, it's a great moment. So Wheeljack combines frequencies on the doohickeys as Devastator disassembles into the six Constructicons, who are all very confused. Megatron spurs them into action as there's only two minutes left till the drill hits the Earth's core. Or, as Prime puts it, Two minutes till the Earth dies. Really hitting home the stakes there really trying to ramp up the drama do you remember that line and how it felt to you as a child or no not specifically no so i can't remember what year the day after it came out let me check do you remember that tv series no but you have mentioned it before it came out in 1983 it was a made for television movie miniseries like back then that was like the thing like the thorn birds and like north mm. and south and things like that it was about nuclear Armageddon. It was like, because we were, at that time, really, it felt like we are on the cusp of it. Like, maybe not as much as we did in the 50s. I'm not sure. I wasn't alive in the 50s. But I remember it feeling very real that, like, okay, at any moment, we might launch nuclear missiles and people will launch nuclear missiles at us. And the day after is, like, what happens after that exchange? And so the idea of the Earth dying was, like, a, it felt like a real thing. It was a real possibility. It wasn't abstract to my little 11-year-old brain. So when Prime says that, I remember that feeling like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it, so they did raise the stakes with the dialogue, but I think it worked, and I, for better or worse, because I, I remember feeling frightened about the concept more than frightened for the, the characters in this story, if that makes sense. Mm. 
Well, Megatron orders the Constructicons to merge back to Devastator and stop the drill. And there's an interesting moment here where Bone Crusher says, Look, guys, if we don't make it, it's been great being part of the team. Hey, we're not scrap iron yet, so don't get drippy. Now, let's transform! And they merge into Devastator and drive down the shaft alongside the drill. So that's kind of an odd speech for a Decepticon yeah. to give, huh? Yeah, so I feel like this is them also trying to like raise that sense of stakes, is that you don't say that unless you think you're going to die, mm-hmm. right? And so, I don't know, I, I'm kind of ambivalent about that line now as a grown-up, but as a kid, that also kind of helped. It, I, I felt that as a child, and, and also because it was a Decepticon saying it. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh, the Decepticons are expressing you know, sort of pride and gratitude for one another before going on a mission. Oh, this feels slightly heroic. And it Mm -hmm. is. I feel like this is also a nice piece of foreshadowing on the part of the writer as to what's going to happen after this. Because that suggests, that suggests, if they can express gratitude, maybe, maybe they're changing a little bit. We'll see. Mm. So Devastator's on his way to stop the drill, and they have one second left. (laughs) Megatron takes off running, hoping he can save his hide somehow. But just then, Devastator breaks the drill, causing an explosion. The Decepticons, other than Devastator, have all retreated as the Autobots survey what's happened. And then Devastator suddenly rises up from below and asks what the Autobots have done with Noble Megatron. I'm afraid Mr. Nobility's busy saving his own neck. (laughs) Wrong! He withdrew to fight Autobot another day. You haven't heard the last of Megatron. What's the matter, Chip? I guess I was hoping Devastator might join the Autobots for good, but that's probably just a dumb old dream. Hang on to your dreams, Chip. The future is built on dreams. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. I Yes, I, I get pearly eyed whenever I hear this scene that ending is really good <laughs> hearing Peter Collins say hang on to your dreams the future is built on dreams oh my gosh like that's how, how can you not be moved by hearing that and then also the visual I mean like we've been kind of like taking some jabs at the ACOM visuals but it ends with Chip's looking sad in his wheelchair and Optimus has leaned down and puts his hand on his shoulder like that oh my god <laughs> give me that reality I'll sell this one in a, in a second for that reality so besides the fact that it's like it's it's a sweet line delivered very warmly by this this father figure transformer character, what I love about this moment is that yeah, Chip's kind of being hard on Devastator with the line about Megatron, but mm-hmm. he's trying to persuade him with words. He's trying yeah. to persuade him with thoughts and with his rendition of reality. I think Megatron's noble. Oh, if he's so noble, how come he just ran off and left you down there? You know, Mm -hmm. and then Devastator thinks about it for a second. There's a pause and he's like, wrong. He went to go fight another day, you know, and then Chip's disappointed because he took the right. This is so great. He took the right tactic and he failed, you know, Mm -hmm. and he feels disappointed by it as you would be. How many times have we done the right thing? And like it didn't like we didn't get the heroic win at the end of the movie like they do. You know, Mm -hmm. it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. But then Optimus is there to say, like, we'll keep doing that. That you just keep doing that. So God dang what a strong ending to this episode. <laughs> like this it cr- created a, a dartboard where every hit is a, a bullseye to, to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that metaphor even makes sense. But yeah, everything about the ending works for me. And it, it all happens in like just a couple seconds. Like they didn't spend a lot of time dwelling on it or like really doing like the filmation He Man ending where like Tila tells you, unpacks that whole scene for you and mm-hmm. explains what that means. They just let it work on you. It just, it's, it's delivered like poetry and you get to like wrestle with it for a long time. Because like as a kid, I didn't quite understand like, well, why wouldn't he just like try to use the Dominator discs again? Because he can't anymore. That was the wrong thing to do. Mm. so gosh hoover i did a complete 180 you know last episode (laughs) was like oh the core oh no there's like a couple (laughs) things i like about it but i'm worried about this one and i get to the other side of it i'm like that was actually i find very little to dislike about the story in this one yep 
It's a pretty darn good episode. Megatron's almost always in control. They do inventive things with Devastator. It's a pretty typical Megatron wants power plot. The only problem is it just doesn't look that great. Yeah. So just listen to it without watching, and I think it comes across as better. Just just let your mind's eye make the animation rather than ACOM, because then you won't be annoyed by all the visual flaws. <laughs> you won't be annoyed by Prowl being all gray except for mm-hmm. like the little bit of metal between the two red fins on his forehead. Yeah. Yeah, weird stuff like that. Optimus's back being painted white or Megatron's mm-hmm. gun barrel from his gun mode painted dark gray on his back. Weird yeah. things. Yeah, but it's got, I mean, so like you point to like the Megatron scenes, I point to like it, it continues to support my hypothesis that uh, intentionally or not, the humans always help the Autobots make better choices. And that scene with Wheeljack wrecking Devastator's brain is so good. It is, it is so, it's so, I don't want to say it's subtle, but they bring no attention to it beyond the fact that it creates more drama in the story. But when you really think about what's happening there, it, how does that, that off-quoted line about like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, something mm-hmm. like that. I'm reminded of that kind of idea of like, that's what Wheeljack's doing. And Chip is the one who learns. Chip is the one who grows. And Wheeljack is like, <laughs> he's still, he's still Wheeljack. <laughs> so, but, but then you have Optimus like reassuring him, like, keep, keep being who you are because we need you to be that. The future is something that's shared by all of us. And we need you to keep on thinking that way so that, you know, I'm, I, in the fact that he has that warm, like, hang on, you know. Also, by the way, as like a side story, you know this, but the listeners don't necessarily know this. The first time I met Peter Cullen, BotCon 1997, I took uh, one of those Transformers action cards, which had the art, the box art of Optimus Prime, Mm -hmm. to get that autographed by him. And he wrote on it, dream on, exclamation (laughs) point. And I remember in the moment, I I was 20, what, 3, 24, something like that. And I didn't quite know what he meant by that. And I was like, was that a, is he taking a dig at me? Like, dream on, kid, or something like that. Like, you'll never be as awesome as, as Optimus Prime. But then he looks at me and he says in that very warm Peter Collin voice, like, dream on, follow your dreams. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> 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 and it's like, you think that the scene at the end of this episode makes me weep? You should have been there in that moment, Hoover. <laughs> You would have been sidestepping like a crab out of the room while I was a complete mess. Oh, my gosh. Everybody should get that. Like, I feel like that's something that should be bottled and distributed worldwide, is hearing Peter Collins say, dream on, follow your dreams, and that he looks you in the eye with those <laughs> clear eyes of his. Oh, my gosh, it's the best. <laughs> anyway, so, whew, good one. This is a really, this is a fun one to do. So, what are we doing next? Well, next up, we have a bit of a special presentation. So have you Mm. noticed that all 11 of the Season 2 episodes that we've done so far have not featured any new characters? So it can Mm. now be revealed that we made our adjustments to the episode script order for this reason. Consider these 11 episodes sort of Season 1.5 or so. There's been zero new characters, but that will all change with our next episode, which is going to be a prime problem. However, Mm. that's not the one we're covering next time. For our next two episodes, we're just going to talk and focus on these 44 Transformers characters. Yes, there's 44, not even including the humans. So before these guys start to get lost in the shuffle of new toys to sell, we're going to give them a nice send-off. So next week, we're going to talk about the 24 Autobots and their human buddies. And then a week later, we're going to talk about the 20 Decepticons and discuss them. That's a nice thought. I like this idea of us saying goodbye to a whole bunch of characters that we're not going to see again a whole lot. I mean, we will see them. You know, they'll be there, especially ones like Bumblebee. Of course. But, you know, it's like they're going to be sort of shuffled a bit to the background in exchange for characters like Beachcomber and Power Glide Mm -hmm. and Aerial Bots and Stunticons and all stuff like that. So we just want to like take a moment to put our final stamp on these 44 or so characters that we've been introduced to so far. You know, before we basically take off on quote unquote the real season two. Neat. All right. I'm in. (laughs) So... 
And then after that, we'll resume with yep. a prime, a prime problem. Prime problem. And we'll continue through the season after that. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, Hoover, for this this exploration. It, it feels good to be essentially done with season one, season 1. 1.5 or whatever. The, the Mario 2, the lost levels. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to like actually just like focusing on just talking about the characters for a bit. Okay. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been the Hoove. You have to dump cold water on me every so often to make sure I still function and no overheat. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas dash Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>